All right, so let's continue. Uh, so hopefully in the break, you've been thinking about the Sleeping Beauty problem, and uh, maybe you have a sense of whether you're a thirder or a halfer or something else. And hopefully you're interested in this problem just in and of itself. You find it an uh, interesting little puzzle. Uh, there is something a bit odd about this, right, that we seem to have this pretty well specified probability puzzle to which we don't, and nobody really decisively knows the answer. Uh, so that seems a bit odd. Um, now, maybe you're of more of a practical mindset and you say, well, that's, that's all fine, but uh, I don't really see this affecting my life in any real way. Uh, or even from a more philosophical angle, you might say, well, uh, I, I agree there's some trickiness here, but here we have some kind of compromising of memory. And I think memory is somehow fundamental to rationality. So if your memory is uh, messed with, then you can't really be rational anyway. So maybe the question doesn't really uh, matter too much or something like that. Um, so to maybe address those kind of uh, views, uh, let's look at maybe a, what I'll call a modern version or really more of an AI inspired version. Uh, so here's a different story you can tell with the Sleeping Beauty puzzle. Uh, so let's think about self-driving cars, but not really like fully autonomous vehicles. These are just low level autonomy cars that normally the driver, the human driver is still in control of, um, but it has an AI system that can intervene when the major, when the, the driver makes a major error. Okay, so if, if, if something really seems to be wrong with the driver, then the car takes over on its own and steers itself, okay? Uh, so and then, and then the AI system wakes up. Uh, so here we have a human driver that maybe that's a good idea for. Um, and when the, when the AI intervenes, uh, let's say it doesn't keep any record whatsoever of the fact that this happens. Maybe people are worried that their insurance would uh, go up or something like that, right? But so no record is kept. Uh, once the AI hands control back to the driver, it's as if it never happened. Uh, now, just to really make it line up with Sleeping Beauty, let's suppose there are two types of drivers in the world. Half of, half of drivers are good, which means they make one major error in their driving career. And the other type is bad, which means they make two major errors in the course of their driving career. And hopefully you kind of see that this starts to look like the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, uh, that basically it's a coin toss, whether it's a good driver with one awakening for the AI system, or a bad driver with two awakenings for the AI system, okay? And so now you can ask this question, suppose you're the AI system and you've just been woken up, right? You just realized something is horribly wrong. You might be interested in what is the probability that this is a good driver? For example, that might uh, affect when you're gonna hand control back to this driver. Uh, and I hope you agree that this is exactly the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, right? Because as the AI system, you're woken up, you don't remember whether you've been woken up before, but you know that you wouldn't remember uh, being woken up before. And so you face the same kind of situation that either you're woken up twice or once, but if you're woken up twice, you don't remember that you've been woken up before, um, exactly the same problem, right? Uh, here's another story. Um, suppose that we have, there's a highway and there's wildlife uh, let's say deer and birds and other things uh, that is near the highway. And so we want to make sure that the wildlife, we'd like to prevent the wildlife from entering the road. Uh, so we, well, first of all, we want to monitor this. So we have some cheap sensors that uh, can monitor maybe, you know, if, if somebody's, if, if an animal steps on the sensor uh, that gives some information and maybe there's even a decision associated with this that maybe sometimes we want to uh, beep Right, the sensor maybe has can beep and try to scare away the animal, uh, but maybe the beep is slightly costly to the battery or something. So you actually want to think about uh, what is likely to be the case. And suppose these sensors don't communicate with each other. Now suppose that deer, right? So we're really concerned about deer entering the road because they're uh, big and uh, and may not be able to get out of the way. Uh, so let's say that deer typically set off two sensors. Whereas birds uh, typically will set off only one. And now we're not so concerned about birds um, because typically they'll get out of the way anyway. I don't know about these birds in this picture, but uh, let's say normally birds, we don't really worry about. And so now you could say, well, from the perspective of a sensor that has just been set off, what is the probability that it's a bird? This is arguably the same problem as the Sleeping Beauty problem. It depends a little bit on whether 
uh, as a sensor, you kind of have a sense of your own identity as opposed to other sensors. If you really want to make sure that it lines up with the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, uh, you can think of it that there's just one sensor uh, that has no memory, right? Then it's really similar to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle. Um, but that one sensor would typically be set off twice by a deer, right? That the deer is kind of hesitating, going back and forth and setting up, sending it off twice. Um, so then certainly you would face the same kind of problem. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's one way to motivate the Sleeping Beauty puzzle. Uh, again, I think for me, the main motivation really is more these kind of highly distributed AI systems with different nodes that don't really remember uh, what other nodes have done. So let's actually try to get a little bit more to the bottom of this Sleeping Beauty puzzle. Um, in kind of the language of extensive form games, you might express the Sleeping Beauty puzzle with this kind of picture. I hope people are a little bit familiar with extensive form games, right? So, but first there's a move by nature or chance that tosses the coin where it comes up either heads or tails. Uh, then the player wakes up definitely on Monday. Uh, if it's tails, then the player also wakes up on Tuesday. And the player cannot tell the difference among any of these three awakenings. And that's why they're all in the same information set. Right, as we represent those things typically in extensive form games. So this is the extensive form game formulation of it, but it's a little bit odd because normally in an extensive form game, we would have some decision for the player to make, right? And so far there is no explicit decision. We've just asked, well, what, what are the player's beliefs? But there's no action. And so maybe we can use that to actually get to the bottom of this and figure out what uh, the right answer to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle is. Uh, and people have tried that. So let's think about bets. Uh, this is also a common strategy in statistics that uh, if you want to argue against a particular way of forming beliefs, one way that you might do so is to show that there are bets that you would take uh, if you form beliefs that way that you really don't want to take. Uh, and kind of the most powerful type of argument there would be a Dutch book. Uh, a Dutch book typically refers to a combination of bets uh, that somebody with a certain belief system or a certain way of forming beliefs would all accept all of those bets, even though when you look at the bets in combination, they're guaranteed to lead to a loss. Uh, so that would be a Dutch book uh, and more, that would be part of a Dutch book argument against that way of forming beliefs. Okay, and so people have tried to do this in the Sleeping Beauty context. So here is an argument by Hitchcock uh, against being a halfer based on this kind of reason. So we're going to now offer Beauty uh, an actual bet. Uh, so when she wakes up, she's going to be presented with this opportunity to take this bet. And in fact, she will be given it every single time that she wakes up. And that's important because let's say that you only offered her to bet on Monday, then the moment that you've offered her to bet, she will update her beliefs and say like, oh, now, now I know it must be Monday, right? So only by making sure that we always offer her to bet uh, in every one of these nodes, will she not be able to update her beliefs based on the fact that she is being offered to bet. Uh, so that's important. So she gets it every single time. Here's the bet. If you take the bet as, uh, as Sleeping Beauty, then if it was in fact the case that the coin landed heads, you will receive 11. But if, it had, if the coin actually had landed tails, you will pay 10. OK, so either you receive 11 or you pay 10. And now the argument is that if you're a halfer, you will accept this bet. Why? Well, you believe it's 50-50 between heads and tails. That's what it means to be a halfer. Uh, and because here the upside of 11 is a little bit larger than the downside of 10, in expectation, it's positive. And we're going to assume here that you're trying to maximize your expected winnings, right? So you're risk neutral. Uh, so the argument is a halfer would take this bet. And by the way, a thirder would not take this bet because a thirder only puts one third probability on heads and you can see an expectation uh, that's gonna work out to, for something negative to something negative for the thirder. Now let's see what actually happens to, uh, to the halfer, halfer beauty, right? So, so Sleeping Beauty who is a halfer uh, will take this bet in each of the three situations. So that means if the coin lands heads, she will be offered this bet once on Monday and she will take it and she'll be happy that she took it because she'll get 11. 
Um, but on the other hand, if the coin lands tails, then she will in fact be, be offered this bet twice. She will take it twice. Uh, and that means that both of them, she's going to have to pay 10 for. So actually in total, she pays negative or she pays 20. So she gets negative 20. And now at this point, you can see that things maybe are going wrong for half her beauty, right? Because in expectation over the whole game, uh, she is losing money. And then you can really drive it home by putting another bet on Sunday uh, that makes sure that she ends up with a sure loss, right? Um, because on Sunday, your beliefs clearly should be 50-50. Uh, and so then you can put another bet there that actually pays out to beauty if the coin lands tails in a way that will make sure that regardless of what, uh, what happens in terms of the coin toss, she will run a loss. Okay. Um, but the, the key thing, and, presume, and when you set up that Sunday bet, that's one that everybody would take. But this bet is really the problem. Right, so if you don't want to be subject to a Dutch book in this way, you should not be taking this bet. But the argument is that the halfer will accept the bet because the upside is larger than the downside and the halfer puts 50-50 probability on the two events. So she would always take the bet. Okay, that's the argument. Uh, let's not run the poll. So you could run the poll again. I've done this in the past to, to run the poll again at this point uh, and see if people switch to, to change their minds. And typically they do, like some people become thirders uh, as a result of this argument at this point in the talk. Uh, I don't know if anybody here did, uh, but let's not do it just for the sake of time. Um, okay, so there was your argument. By the way, now this starts to look a little bit more like a typical extensive form game, right? Where, uh, so here's what it looks like uh, depending on, so now the action that player one, Sleeping Beauty takes is whether to accept or reject the bet. So now, now it really looks like an extensive form game. Okay, um, but it turns out there's a counter argument to this Dutch book argument, right? So there's a defense for the halfer. And in fact, it involves evidential decision theory. So we're kind of back to the beginning of this part of the tutorial um, when we talked about causal and evidential decision theory. So here is the argument. The argument is that uh, for that bet that we just presented, if you're an evidential decision theorist, you would not take that bet. And so you would escape the Dutch book. Uh, here's how it goes. Again, I, the idea of evidential decision theory is that when you make a decision, you think about for each option, what would it tell you about the world if you took that option, right? And this is a little bit similar to the, the, the cookie problem from before, right? The, the lockdown dilemma. Um, because you can now reason as follows. Suppose you're a halfer, but you're an evidential decision theorist halfer then you might argue, well, there's a 50% probability that it's heads, according to me, because I'm a halfer. Uh, if I accept, then, well, I'm gonna end up with 11 in that case. But with 50% probability, it's tails. And now here comes the key thing. If I accept, if and if the coin really landed tails, that means there's another day on which I'm uh, asked about the same bet. Right? Either it was yesterday or it's tomorrow. I don't know which one it is, but there is another day. And if I accept now, then I can be pretty sure I accept on the other day as well, right? Because like I'll be in exactly the same situation. I'm still the same person. So why would I somehow choose something different? Uh, and so overall, if I accept, then I expect to get negative 20 in the case where it's tails. So in expectation, I get something negative. On the other hand, if I were to reject the bet, then I'm pretty sure that no matter what, I'm going to end up with zero, right? Even if it's tails, probably if I reject, then I'm going to reject on the other day as well. So I'm going to end up with zero. Hence, I do not accept the bet. Okay, this makes sense. So actually, uh, there's a way to be a halfer and not be subject to that particular Dutch book if you're an evidential decision theorist, right? Uh, in contrast, if you were a causal decision theorist and a halfer, then it seems the Dutch book really does work. Right? Because now in that case, you're going to argue, well, when I'm thinking about this bet, whatever I'm doing on the other day, whether it's uh, yesterday or tomorrow, if there is another day, I can't affect that now. Right? Like If it's in the past, certainly I can't affect it. In the future, it's also not really clear how I could possibly affect it because my memory will be erased. So I should just think about the effects of today's bet. Uh, this is the way that you really do fall for the Dutch book. And this is the kind of reasoning 
that was implicit on the slide that I showed before for Hitchcock's Dutch book. Okay, so that's the setup. Uh, so there is an escape. It turns out that, uh, so in some sense, and so now you might wonder, well, what if I combine things in different ways? You could have an evidential decision there is thirder, okay? Uh, we won't go over it, but you can put a you can put together a Dutch book for that person as well. But in a sense, uh, there are arguments in the literature that, uh, and even proofs under in particular settings at least, that if you're a causal decision theorist thirder or an evidential decision theorist halfer, you cannot be Dutch booked. Meaning not just that particular Dutch book, but that you nobody can. Uh, there's no Dutch book that anybody can construct that you would fall for. Um, again, I'm, I'm not gonna rerun the poll for Sleeping Beauty, um, but when I have in the past, that actually then would, you know, then some people move back to being a halfer um, because now there is apparently kind of a safe way of being a half. Okay. Um, however, this argument here, it assumes that um, there's only one kind of awakening, right? And, and in game theoretic sense, there's only one information set. And uh, I have an argument that uh, you, if you look at more general settings, then you can, in fact, Dutch book evidential decision theorists, right? So I, I said earlier, I've made arguments against both. You've seen the causal decision theorist argument that I have done with Kasper Oesterheld, uh, who's a fantastic PhD student working with me. Uh, that's what that is. And, um, but here's the Dutch book against evidential decision theory if there's more than one information set. Okay. Uh, here's how this one works. We're gonna think about uh, Sleeping Beauty. So this is Sleeping Beauty-like problem, but with a different setup with different coins and so on. Uh, and this, in this version, she doesn't just wake up, but she also wakes up in a particular color room. So the color room uh, is the different, uh, corresponds to the information set that she's in, right? So the, when you wake up, the only information that you have is the color of the room. And now we have uh, two, two fair coins for four different outcomes. So everything is fair, one quarter probability. Uh, so we have the white black coin. That's the first coin that determines in which color room you're going to wake up on Monday. Right? So the W or the B here is the first room you wake up in. And then the second coin determines what you're going to wake up, up in the next day, Tuesday. Uh, and that coin is called gray or other. Uh, so either it, it co comes up gray, in which case you're going to wake up in a gray room the next day, or it comes up other, and that means that you're going to wake up in the opposite color of what you woke up in the first day. So if you woke up in a white room on Monday and the second coin came up other, then the next time you'll wake up in a black room. Okay, so three different colors, three different information sets that you can uh, wake up in, white, black, and gray. Okay, uh, and here there's no staying asleep in this example. And now the bets work out as follows as in this table. Uh, so there's a Sunday bet and the purpose of the Sunday bet is just to make sure that no matter what the outcome of the coins, you're gonna run a loss if you're an evidential decision theorist. The key thing here is bet two. Okay, bet two is offered uh, if you're either in a white or a black room. It's not offered in, if you're in a gray room. Okay, and here's how it works. So if you take bet two, uh, and you're in, uh, sorry, and, it, and it's in fact, so it really bet two is about the second coin, right? Bet two is about whether the second coin comes up gray or other. If the second co coin comes up gray, then you go down by 24. You have to pay 24 if you took that bet, okay? On the other hand, if the second coin comes up other, uh, then you will gain nine, only nine. Okay, that's the setup. So, uh, so would you take that bet in either a white or a black room? So first we have to think about what's your belief if you wake up in a white room? And now this actually doesn't really depend on whether you're a, a halfer or a third is the argument, right? Because let's say you wake up in a white room. Uh, so now of course you know that you're not in the last world, the, the, the world all the way on the right here, the black gray uh, room, right? Because that one doesn't have a white awakening. But every one of the other possibilities, the first three ways that the coins might land, there's gonna be exactly one white room out of two awakenings. Uh, 
And so presumably you would have uh, a belief of one third of being in each of those worlds. So one third a belief that you're in the white gray world, one third belief that you're in the white other world, and one third belief that you're in the black other world, right? And you know, of course you would know which day it was conditional on the world that you're in. And the argument is that like, that doesn't really matter there. It doesn't really matter whether you're a thirder or a halfer in the original Sleeping Beauty problem. Presumably everybody would agree here that that probability is one third. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to bet two. What happens here is, let's say, first of all, you're a causal decision theorist. You're not gonna take this bet. That's the argument. Um, because let's say you woke up in a white room, you think there's a one third chance now that uh, the second coin came up gray. And, but the downside is pretty big. It's 24 that you lose as opposed to nine that you win if, it's, uh, if the second coin came up other. Uh, so even with even taking into account the fact that there's twice as much probability of the second thing happening, that still only gets you to 18. That's less than 24. Uh, so you would. So if you're a causal decision theorist, you will not take this bet. Now the argument is that if you're an evidential decision theorist, you will take this bet for the following reason. Uh, suppose you are right. So so you're an evidential decision theorist. You're thinking about whether to take this bet. And now the argument is that. Suppose you take this bet, and suppose you, like in a white room, suppose you take this bet. The argument is, and the, the, you know, this is key to the argument, that then uh, you really should believe you're going to take the bet in a black room as well. Because if you look at this whole setup, everything is symmetric between white and black. So it seems there's no reason to think that you should act differently in a white room than in a black room. So if you take the bet in a white room, you're also going to take it in a black room, uh, if, so, if there is a black room at any point. And that means that you're going to be now extra optimistic about the second bet, because in the case where it pays off, it's also going to pay off on another day, right? And, you're, uh, and in the case where it doesn't pay off, well, there isn't another day on which you're asked to take the bet. And so overall, you're going to be happier taking the bet, and you're going to take the bet. And as a result, you're going to fall for the Dutch book, right? because the last row here of this table actually says that this thing is in fact a Dutch book, that no matter which world materializes, you're going to go down by two if you take all these bets. So that's the argument against being an evidential decision theorist. Uh, it again relies very much on the idea that what you do in a white room gives you evidence about what you would do in a black room, right? That's essential for this to work. Um, but it also turns out that if you don't do that, or so if you're if you're willing to be an evidential decision theorist, where such that you don't think that what you do in a white room is evidence for what you do in a black room, uh, then this kind of Dutch book will not apply to you, right? And in fact, you will be okay. Uh, you will never be Dutch booked in that case. Okay, so there's a whole, uh, this is just sort of one thread of argument in the Sleeping Beauty literature and there are other kinds of arguments about, uh, you know, being willing to agree with people that you talk with and other kinds of things uh, in order to try to figure out what to do in the uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, puzzle, but I would say it's still not a settled uh, debate. There are still people who are halfers and there are still people who are thirders that have thought about it. In both cases, they've thought about it for a long time and they're reasonable and intelligent people. And so, you know, uh, don't judge anybody for being uh, the other kind of, right? So if you, uh, if you take this uh, puzzle to your significant other, be understanding. Then, um, okay. But so now there's still the question, um, of, well, is there even an answer to this thing, right? You might at this point believe that it's really not, you know, there's really no fundamental answer to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle. And it's all just kind of about accounting in some sense, right? That uh, if you want to be a, if you want to form beliefs in a, in a third or kind of way, you better pair that up with causal decision theory in order to make good decisions. Um, but you can also, in some sense, do the accounting in a different way, and you can be a halfer in terms of how you form beliefs. You just have to be careful to combine that with evidential decision theory. Uh, and so maybe the whole thing is just about accounting, and there is no true answer to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle. Um, so that's an interesting take, right? Uh, and maybe that's as far as kind of the straightforward mathematics can bring us. Um, I'm still inclined to think that, you know, in some sense, there should be an answer to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, right? I can imagine myself in that situation and wanting to form beliefs about what situation I'm in. Um, 
But I also think that this kind of gets into other areas of philosophy, such as metaphysics and philosophy of mind. Uh, and that may seem a little surprising, but so let me try to explain why I think that is. And I'll also reveal that uh, I'm more inclined to the third position myself, right? Uh, as you might infer from some of the things we talked about, though, right? Like here, I'm arguing against evidential decision theory in this context, which is the thing that saves the Hafer from this Dutch book and something like that. Uh, uh, though, again, like with Casper, I have this other paper that argues against causal decision theory. So, but, but still, I'm more inclined to the third position. And that uh, obliges me maybe to say something about why I think that first argument for being a halfer is wrong, right? Remember that argument, very simple. Just uh, on Sunday, you should believe that uh, it's 50-50, right? That seems pretty uncontroversial. Um, but then when you wake up, uh, the argument for the half is that you've learned nothing new because you knew you were going to be woken up, so you shouldn't update your beliefs. So what do I think is wrong with, so I, I, I should somehow be able to say what I think is wrong with that if I want to be a thirder instead, right? Um, and I do agree with the claim that like if I haven't learned anything new, then I shouldn't update my belief, so I have to somehow argue that there's something new that I've learned. And so the question here in my mind is what is it that we're conditioning on, right? So we're, uh, right, if you want to think about this invasion in terms, you want to think about, well, what's the probability that the coin came up heads given, and then, well, what comes after the given? Right? That, that's the key thing. If what comes after the given is that uh, the, the following statement, that at, at some point in time, there is an awakening, right? If that's all you learn, then it seems that the half argument is correct. Because from the beginning, we knew that there would be an awakening at some point. So that doesn't really uh, tell you anything. Instead, what I think is going on is that what you learn is something different. What you learn is uh, not that at some point in time there is an awakening, but what you learn is that I have just been awoken. And I argue that that is different, but that is really going into metaphysics in some sense. Uh, so I have. Uh, a paper on this that's not at all like a paper with no math uh, in a uh, philosophy journal that tries to get at some of these things. I'll try to quickly go over it just to give some illustration. I don't know if this is going to resonate with anybody, but we'll move on pretty quickly. But just to illustrate, uh, here's so here, here's an argument for a related kind of idea. Uh, imagine you go on a programming binge uh, and you decide to build this whole simulated world with its own physics that's maybe a little bit different from our physics and with creatures walking around in the simulated world, the creatures are maybe a little bit different from us as well. Uh, so I've shown them here, like they have three legs because they're different from us. Uh, one has kind of a blocky head and there's something like light in this world. Okay. Uh, also imagine you're a brilliant programmer, you make no mistakes and like so the thing compiles right away and you set it to run like no errors never happens to me, but that's, uh, let's imagine that that's how it was. Uh, except imagine you made one little mistake and that is just that you didn't put any output on the screen. You forgot to print something to the screen, right? That's a typical error that we sometimes make. And the thing is just running there silently. And, uh, and now presumably that's not what we wanted, right? Presumably what you wanted was actually to get something like this on your screen. For example, you might say, well, I wanna see the displayed perspective of one of the creatures. Okay, so this here would in fact be the, the round headed creature here on the left, uh, that, that creature's perspective, looking at the, the block headed creature. Okay, uh, so fine. Um, now the key thing here is that when you realize this mistake and you wanna get to something like two, you need to write some additional code, right? You actually need to write some code that puts something on the screen. And as you do that, you need to make a couple more actual decisions. Right? You need to determine in which real world colors to display perception in the simulated world, right? Because we said like there's some kind of simulated light, but there isn't an obvious correspondence to, that says that this should be displayed in blue or in red or whatever. And of course, you also have to decide which agent's perspective to display, like the round headed creature here. So there's some additional decisions, right, about this world. And so now the argument here is that two is more like our conscious experience than one. Right, uh, and also kind of related to Sleeping Beauty puzzle, right? That I wake up, right, and now that I have some particular experience. Or right now, there is this experience of looking at a screen, uh, and some of you 
uh, and that's kind of what's given, right? Uh, and so that's really more what consciousness, consciousness is like. And that's also maybe the kind of thing that Sleeping Beauty is conditioning her beliefs on. Uh, and that requires something additional besides just the laws of physics that tell you how things run, like we see here in one, but also something that tells you about which experience is given or displayed. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. And then the paper goes into much more detail about like to what extent is this argument correct or where might it fall apart. Um, but just uh, the main point of this is just to illustrate why I think the true answer to the Sleeping Beauty puzzle maybe goes into metaphysics rather than just being resolvable through uh, a bunch of equations. Okay, um, so let's move on from that. Now I wanna uh, briefly touch on a very closely related problem uh, that has its origins in the game theory literature, the absent-minded driver problem, uh, which you may have heard of before. Uh, and it's very much like the Sleeping Beauty puzzle in the sense that there's also forgetfulness. So uh, imperfect recall is, is crucial here as well. Uh, but it's a little bit different because here also what action you take in some sense affects whether you're going to be woken up again. So that's something that's not there in the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, right? In the Sleeping Beauty puzzle, the coin determines whether you're going to be woken up again. Your decision about like whether you take a bet or something doesn't affect that, whether you're going to be woken up again. Uh, but here it does. So here is the story of the absent-minded driver problem. Um, you are a driver on a monotonous highway, really boring highway, so boring that you just kind of forget where you've already been. Uh, and your goal is to take the second exit. Right? So here's the picture. You start at the top, uh, and so you you have to you really want to exit at Y. That would give you utility of four uh, coming to B. Um, but you. But because this thing is so monotonous, you can't distinguish whether you're at X or at Y. If you come to Y, you're like, wait, did I already pass an exit? I'm not sure, right? The same as if you would be at X. And if you exit at X, you would actually get only zero. And if you just keep going, eventually you would just get one. Okay, so what should you do here? Well, first of all, it turns out any deterministic strategy that you might play uh, isn't going to be very good, first of all, right? Because like either you say, okay, I'm always going to exit, well, then you're going to get zero for sure. You're going to exit right away. Or you say you always continue, and then you're going to get one for sure. That's a little bit better, uh, but still not great. Uh, and moreover, it's not stable because let's say that, you know, you're kind of, kind of your plan was that you would just go straight and continue. Uh, but then you wake up at an exit and you're like, hey, wait, I don't know which exit this is, but uh, given that I follow, given that normally I just continue, yeah, there's maybe a 50% chance that I'm at Y. So the odds look pretty good for me to exit, right? I would, if, if I just deviated today and exited instead, uh, I can expect, an, expect a utility of two, right? There's a half chance that I would get four. That's better than just continuing getting the one. So in that sense, it's not stable because of course, if I'm always uh, exiting, then I would be inclined to continue and do better that way. So the optimal thing here to do is to randomize. Uh, and with a little bit of math, you can figure out that the optimal exit probability here is one third, right? If, if that's your policy, if you, so if you can't condition on whether you're at X or Y, of course, if you can condition on whether you're at X and Y, it's easy, then you would just exit at Y. But if you can't, then the best thing to do is to randomize. The strictly best thing is to randomize uh, and exit with probability one third whenever you see an exit. But there's still the question about stability, right? So now let's think again about this idea that, oh, like I woke up at some exit uh, and I know that normally I follow this one third policy. Should I in fact continue with this one third policy or should I do something different? Now Piccione and Rubenstein, they actually provide a number of different analyses in their paper, but one of them that they give goes as follows that we have some belief we're at X uh, and then we're trying to gonna optimize P, the probability that we exit now. Now, the way that they do this, uh, is just a little bit of math, but implicit in this math is the assumption that if you're gonna use P now and you're currently at X, uh, that might get you to continue and then you're gonna use the same probability again if you're at Y, that's implicit in the analysis. If you do that whole thing, you will solve and you will get the optimal P star being a function of your belief in this way. Right, uh, one over two B uh, minus one sixth. But this actually doesn't seem to really work because if you really did P equals one third, 
then you should get a belief that there's three fifths chance that you're at X. If you think about that for, because like, you know, with probably one third you exit. So that's how much less probability in some sense ends up at uh, Y. For every three units of probability that end up at X, only two of them end up at Y. That's why it's three fifths. Hope that makes some intuitive sense. But then you would get a different uh, piece. So then you would end up with a different P star. So it seems like the optimal solution is not stable. But something about this analysis also seems a little bit funny. Like there's some kind of evidential reasoning in it that like if we're going to use P now, we're also we're also going to use it at Y. But the belief formation isn't really like halving and shouldn't be really depend on P, right? Because depending on what P you pick, you would think it's more or less likely that you actually made it to the second exit. So something here seems a little bit odd. Here's a different analysis by Alman Hart and Perry. Uh, though actually in, in, a, in a forum, also this analysis is in fact in the Picciona and uh, Rubenstein paper. Um, but here's kind of a more uh, thirder slash CDT lines, right? We've already seen that being a thirder and being a causal decision theorist seem to kind of line up well with each other. Uh, so suppose you reason this way. We normally expect to play one third, which is the optimal. And now we're thinking of whether we should deviate, about, deviate from that this time only. So without an evidential effect, uh, that we say, okay, well, if we deviate, it's this time only, it's not going to affect our beliefs about what we did otherwise, or we're not going to care about that. Um, and if you reason that out, then the expected utility for exiting uh, turns out to be eight fifths, but also for continuing, it turns out to be eight fifths. So we have this idea that's very familiar in game theory, that we're indifferent between the two options. And as a result, we'd be willing, in fact, to randomize and play one third. Uh, now there's a question of whether this always works. And the answer is basically yes, uh, as is uh, that there's a proof of this in some sense in both of these papers. And we've kind of generalized that a little bit further still uh, to settings with other symmetries and there are other related papers uh, to this as well. But overall, uh, this is pretty uh, consistent um, though. Uh, there can also be other equilibria. That's a little bit tricky. And so this is one equilibrium, but you might also have equilibria that are not going to be the, uh, the optimal policy from the outside. Now you might wonder whether, given what we've said, right, like is there now also a way to be consistently something like a halfer and an evidential decision theorist, right? Uh, would that also work? So can you get that accounting thing to work as well? It turns out you can, but it's a little bit tricky. So at some point I was, uh, oh, by the way, I should point out my co-authors, uh, Scott Emmons here uh, was an undergraduate student in a joint program at Duke and UNC and is now uh, also one of Stuart Russell's PhD students. Uh, Cusper is one of my brilliant students uh, here at Duke uh, and Andrew Critch is also at Berkeley. And um, okay, so could you get this to work could you get some kind of analysis like this to work with being a halfer and an evidential decision theorist or something like that? Uh, and it turns out you can. Now, at some point, I got a little cocky and uh, I was giving a, I was about to give a talk in Australia. I did, there were uh, two workshops that they were doing back to back in Australia and there was a weekend in between. And so I had this plan that like over the weekend, I'm just going to figure this out, how you uh, combine being a halfer and an evidential decision theorist in a way that it works in the absent-minded driver case. Um, and I figured like it, it won't be so hard. And, but so there I was and I was trying to figure this out and I just got totally stuck and I couldn't, I couldn't do it and I was getting kind of frustrated, but then it was somebody's birthday. And so we went out and we had some fun. And then the next morning I was lying in bed and I was kind of jet lagged this, because it was in Australia and we had just gone out and as I'm lying there. And eventually I figured out, ha, like there's actually no way to do it. Um, because here's a counter example. So here's the counter example that I uh, came up with eventually in my maybe not clearest state. There we go. Look at this example. Uh, so this is kind of like a like an absent-minded driver scenario. We're going from the start, except now you can go either left or right to exit. Okay. And again, you can't tell the difference between the two exits. If you look at this example, it's not too hard to convince yourself that actually the optimal strategy to commit to is just to go left, right? Just take this one, that's the best you can do. Because if you try to get this four minus epsilon, the best chance you're gonna get, the best way to do that is just to exit with probability one half at each of them. 
but then you're going to end up there only with one quarter. That's going to be a little bit worse. Okay, so that, the, the solution that you want is very simple here, just exit. But the argument is, what should you do if you're at an intersection and you believe in evidential decision theory? Uh, okay, well, if you're considering that you're playing strategy just to exit left, then presumably you expect to just get one by exiting. What would you consider, what would you expect to get if you uh, thought that the policy that you were following was one half, one half, so one half right and one half straight, which is the policy that's going to get you here, four minus epsilon uh, to four minus epsilon with the largest probability. Well, if you're thinking about that, you should have some belief that you're currently already at Y, right? That presumably should be positive because sometimes you continue. Uh, I'm also gonna argue that that probably shouldn't be a function of epsilon somehow. That would be weird if it was a function of what epsilon was. It should be a function of what your policy is, but presumably not about what epsilon is. Uh, if you believe both of those things, then the expected utility that you expect now, like from the inside being in an exit, the expected utility that you would expect to get if you were to adopt the second policy is going to be something that is a little bit bigger than one for sufficiently small epsilon, right? And then the intuition is that if you're at X, you would expect to get about one, a little bit less than one. But if you're at Y, you've already made it halfway there. And so you actually would expect to get something closer to two. Uh, and that means that evidential decision theory suggests that you should do one half, one half, right? Because conditional on doing that, you currently expect to be happier. And I thought this settled it. I thought, okay, we're done, right? This is never going to work. Uh, and I emailed Cusper. And Cusper, uh, to his credit, patiently explained to me why, uh, no, no, it works. It works just fine. And here's how, it, uh, here's how Cusper explained it. Uh, look, you know, it works because uh, consider probabilities of entire trajectories that you might be on, right? So what determines the state of the world? It's the trajectory that you're on plus where you are currently. Uh, and we're going to reason in a kind of halving sort of way as is the goal. So the probability that we're on the path from X to Y to four minus epsilon, and we're currently at X, is the probability that we're on that path or that that path takes place, which is uh, one quarter. Uh, plus the probability that we're at X, given that we're on that path, which is one half, right? Because there are two places that we could be on the path. Uh, there's, and similarly, the probability that we're on the same path, but we're currently at Y is the same. So both of those are one eighth. Um, and now any other trajectory doesn't really matter because we're gonna end up with zero anyway. But that means that our expected utility uh, based on this is going to be one minus epsilon over four. And that's in fact worse than one. So everything is fine. Epsilon, EDT is not gonna pick this policy. It's gonna pick instead the policy that we know to be optimal, which is just to go left. And at this point I was just really confused because this all seemed perfectly right. And at the same time also the counter example from the previous slide seems perfectly right. So, but certainly can't like what, what's going on? Right, something seemed, something must be off. And the, the weird thing is that what happens with this way of reasoning on this slide is that now you're gonna have beliefs about trajectories of where you are that don't align with the coins probabilities that you're gonna use to follow. Uh, in particular, if you think that you're, if you tell me that I'm at X, then it's more likely that I'm about to exit than that I'm about to continue. Because if I'm about to exit, conditional on being on that kind of path, I certainly would wake up at X because there's nowhere else to wake up. Uh, and so if you, if you go through the math, you will actually find that the probability of being on the path to zero, given that we follow this policy, and given that we're, we are at X is two thirds, even though I'm about to toss a fair coin for what I'm about to do. So this seems really weird. So like I have this fair coin in my hand that I'm gonna use to determine what I'm about to do. And because that's the case, I expect the coin to land uh, one way rather than the other. And that is more likely that it's going to land one way than the uh, other, even though I know it to be a fair coin. So this is this requires kind of a weird way of twisting your brain that where you are, uh, if you want to follow this in a way that you're going to get optimal policies, you have to somehow allow for the fact that where you are carries information about the coins that you're about to toss. Uh, 
So that's a little hard to stomach. And of course, you could always go back to being a third or and a causal decision theorist, but you can twist your brain in a way that this actually works out. Okay. Uh, so that gives some background. Now we've thought about doing this in kind of more Markov decision processy kind of settings. I'll skip over that uh, in the interest of time. There's this issue that you might end up at a suboptimal equilibrium. Uh, and one way you can think about that is you can think about this in kind of evolutionary game theory terms to as a way of computing an equilibrium. Uh, and here's if you did that, here's how often in a particular set of games you would actually end up in the optimal equilibrium. Uh, and so once the games get bigger, you see this actually drops. So you can't uh, necessarily expect to be ending up in an optimal equilibrium. Okay, we're just about out of time. I wanna throw out one more thing. I'll skip over some things. And of course, if anybody has any questions at any point about any of this, uh, please feel free to ask me uh, either now or in the chat or by email, just let me know. One more thing I wanted to point out is this concept of program equilibrium. Uh, introduced by Moshe Tenenholtz in 2004. Uh, this is a, a different way of getting around uh, defection in the prisoner's dilemma. So we're gonna play the prisoner's dilemma, but instead of just playing it directly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write uh, a program for our agent to follow. And so really we are the programmers, we're the players of this game and our strategies now are programs rather than just actions. And now there's an interesting equilibrium in programs uh, where we actually will cooperate. And this is what it is. Uh, suppose both players adopt this program. Uh, and this relies on the programs being legible to each other, right? So going back to what we talked about before, that's with, uh, with AI or, uh, or software systems that is actually feasible to do. And so we say, okay, well, if the other's code equals my code, then I will cooperate, otherwise I will defect. And if you think about this for a little while, that is actually an equilibrium for both players to play this. Because if you deviate from this program and you do something else, that's going to result in the other player defecting and that's gonna be worse for you. Okay. Then we have some further work uh, on this. I'm happy to talk to anybody about this that's interested, um, but since I'm out of time, let me conclude. Uh, so just you know, concluding the whole tutorial, uh, what was the main message of the uh, tutorial? Well, in AI, and I think also in the EC community, when we think about software agents, uh, traditionally we kind of strive for the homo economicus model. Right? That's a model that's often been criticized for, well, you know, people aren't really rational, um, but we might expect AI systems to be. But I would argue AI systems are very much unlike us in other ways that are important to take into account here, right? That AI systems could be very distributed, they could intentionally forget. Uh, and we have to somehow figure out what they want. So this model is not always appropriate for AI. We have to think about choosing objective functions, how we do that, thinking about what information is shared and kept around uh, that affects belief formation. And as we've seen, that also affects how, you, affects how you should make decisions. And so the main message here is for all these questions, social choice uh, and decision and game theory and foundations of all those fields uh, provide a solid foundation to address these questions, but we definitely have a lot of work to do. So let me end there and thank you very much.